Hi everyone, and welcome to Daisy Styles. Back in March of this year, I started to really want to create a Norwegian fjord horse custom. I myself am Norwegian, and I'm fond of the breed, but I don't really have one fjord horse model that I really love, so I thought it was time to change that. Now for the base model, the Collecta Fjord Stallion would have been the obvious choice, as he is a very nice sculpt. However, he is pretty small, and I want this model to fit my rider doll, so that won't really work. I have this model though, the Collecta Icelandic Stallion. I wasn't really planning on customizing this guy, but I don't really feel like waiting for shipping time for another one, so yeah, you're coming with me. <laughs> I have some pretty drastic plans for this model, so first I need to ask dad if he can saw his head off. Will do. Saw again? Yeah. Big shout out to dad for being a good sport about this. <laughs> now that the head and body are separated, I'm going to cut away the remaining pieces of mane, but to make the plastic a bit easier to cut, I'm going to soak the pieces in boiling hot water first. I remove the mane, ears, and any rough edges, both on the head and on the body. I also cut away the text on the belly, where it says made in China and stuff, as I don't believe that appears on real horses. My plans for this model don't just include a new neck, I actually want to achieve an entirely different pose. So I spent a lot of time studying my reference pictures, planning out where I need to make the cuts before I make them. Then I pretty much just go to town, cutting the horse apart by the joints, but oh, that doesn't look safe. Oh shit, oh shit. I just switched out the blade on my box cutter, so I definitely felt that, um, but I guess now the band-aid will act as a shield as I continue to round out the edges of the cut pieces. Oh, and look who's back to steal the show once again. Now to reattach the legs and head in the position that I want to, I'll first be getting out the drill and drilling into all the cut surfaces. On some of the leg pieces, I drill all the way through, so when I'm reconnecting the legs, I can thread the wire all the way through, and that way it will be a lot more stable. Once I'd connected all the legs, I spent a lot of time off camera just adjusting the pose. This usually takes a couple days, as once I move one leg a little bit, the other one looks weird in comparison, and so it goes on for a while. But many tweaks later, I ended up with a pose I feel pretty happy with, at least I think. But I believe a package just arrived, so let's take a small break to unbox some items kindly sent me for free by Eminem Schleck. She recently opened an online store to sell her 3D printed accessories for model horses, so let's see. They're all nicely wrapped, and in the first package, we have a small shelf with some containers. Next are these two buckets, which are a part of the feeding set, and I think these are already my favorite. The next items are part of the same set, and includes a green feed scoop and a pink container for supplements, as well as a grain bag you glue together yourself. Next package contains... Hmm, what is this? Oh, I know, it's a Liverpool. I'm guessing the next packages will be jump related then. Uh-huh, I was right. But look at these Cavalettis though, these are so cool. Next up are some basic jump stands, and these even have adjustable cups, which is super awesome. I got a pair in green and neon orange. Of course, there are also jump poles, 
and these are made of cardboard so she wrote that you could customize them using markers or paint which is really cool lastly she included a diy halter set with instructions in french but they were very simple so i managed to put it together these items and more are all available on her website which i will link down below along with a promo code for 10 percent off and some additional information Thanks M&M like for sending me these items, now back to the fjord. So I was a little bit unsure about the pose I had chosen, so I decided to tweak and test a little bit more, and I ended up with this pose instead, which I like a lot more. To fill in all the gaps and to sculpt new details, I'll be using two-part epoxy sculpt. I use my hands as well as various sculpting tools to get the right shapes and details, and I use water to prevent the clay from sticking. At this point, I had already spent many days looking at my reference pictures compared to my model, especially looking at the proportions of the legs and how they work in conjunction with each other. Usually when I start making a pose, I can think I'm pretty happy with it after a couple hours. Then when I come back the next day, I see like a hundred things that are very wonky and need fixing. So I'd rather take several days of my time and really be happy with the result rather than rushing it and see many things I need to fix after I've started sculpting or painting. Anyways, since I cut away parts of the feathers on some of the legs, I had to try to seamlessly sculpt in the missing parts, which was a challenge. I'm not the best at sculpting flowing hair, but this was good practice. Filling in the gaps by the joints pretty much always poses a challenge as it's very much prone to looking chunky. Therefore, I try to always add as little clay as I possibly can while still making it look good, of course. And I also shave down parts of the legs where it's needed. So this right front leg was lifted and bent just like this on the original model, but because I had a different pose in mind at first, I cut it apart quite a lot, but now I'm having to reconstruct it in the exact same way it originally was, which is kind of annoying. Now that I'm finished with sculpting the legs, I'll move over to the neck. And this time I'll be paying extra attention to the shoulders to make sure that they fit with the movement of the front legs. While I was sculpting, I was keeping the characteristics of a fjord in mind as I want the model itself to resemble the breed. I didn't want to just slap a short mane and a done color on the model and just call it a fjord, you know? From what I read, they usually have short but muscular necks, and their heads are small with a wide forehead and big cheeks. I think my model's forehead is a bit too narrow, but there wasn't really anything I could do about that, so I just tried to lean on the other things and hope it would compensate. Now apart from his ears, his body is fully sculpted, and before I do sculpt the ears, I'll be prepping him. This basically means removing any imperfections, cracks, bumps, or lumps, and for this I'll be using sandpaper first. When I've sanded away the imperfections I can see at this point, I'm going to give him a spray of primer, but first I'm giving him a quick rinse with soap and water to remove any oils from my hands that could interfere with the spray. And while we wait for the model to dry, we take a short dance break. <laughs> Once I've sprayed my model with primer, there is almost always a plethora of imperfections that seemingly come from nowhere, but they also must be eliminated. So I just go to town with my sandpaper. And yeah, this step is very tedious and boring, but it does make a big difference and makes the model look nice and polished. I find it very helpful to put the light behind the model like this as it highlights the texture of the horse and makes it easier to see places I need to correct. Now the model is looking nice and flawless. Well, apart from this, uh, <laughs> he definitely needs some ears. 
I take my time deciding on the correct placement for them. Then I drill in a couple holes to insert some armature wire. And like that, an ear has appeared. Now, I've always struggled a bit with ears, and I tried a different technique this time, so let me show you what I did. I first form it into a teardrop shape like I usually have done, but then instead of flattening it, I just stop it onto the wire and then sculpt it from there. I start by kind of smearing the epoxy downwards to attach it to the model, then I sculpt the inside of the ears, and it's by no means a simple operation, there's a lot of back and forth involved, but I think this is the best technique I've used this far. The last thing now that needs to be sculpted is his mane and forelock, and of course I'm going for that signature roached fjord style. I want my fjord to look a little bit scruffy and rough and not super proper, so I'm purposely making the mane not stand straight up, but be a little bit more skewed outwards. I also found it easier to sculpt the two sides of the mane separately, so I let one side cure first and then I started on the other one. I filled in the middle part of the mane, then I use a dedicated epoxy toothbrush to add some texture. Now I really like that typical fluffy fjord forelock, so I wanted to achieve something similar for my model while still remaining tack friendly so he can wear bridles. Eventually I ended up with this, which I absolutely love, I think it's actually so adorable and one of the best forelocks I've sculpted so far I think. Now finally, after many weeks of work, he is finally finished and I shamelessly love him. I think he's adorable. Now it's time to really solidify the Fjord look by creating his coat, starting with paints. As usual, I give the model somewhere between 4 and 8 coats of watered out acrylic paint. I'm using an off-white shade this time. And while the paint is drying, I put the model under a clean box to prevent dust from settling on it. Once the model is fully painted, I'm going to spray him with sealant outside, which turned out to be the cause of much frustration down the line. But for now, I'm wearing my filtration mask and giving the model two coats of Mr. Super Clear. You see the tree in the background that my camera insisted on focusing on instead of the model? Yeah, you see it rustling in the wind? That's going to turn out to be a problem down the line. Anyways, once the sealant is dry, I can start adding soft shades of color using my pen pastels. As I mentioned in previous videos, I start by adding a layer of pastel in the same color as the base shade, which in this case is white. Then to achieve that classic brown done fjord color, I'm mixing up a fair bit of white with some warm brown. I've found that when I work with lighter coat colors like this one, they are more prone to getting grainy, which is like my number one problem when working with pastels. And spoiler alert, will be with this model as well, but with unexpected causes. I do my best to prevent it though, by slowly building up the colors rather than going in with darker shades all at once. When the color I'm applying isn't really building anymore and won't become more opaque, I go in with another layer of sealant, then apply a slightly darker shade of pastel, and so on. After about three or four layers of sealant and pastel, I was noticing that the model was strangely grainy and uneven in the color, which was confusing since I've been using all the tricks in the book and was being really careful to avoid it. A couple more coats later and the situation was not any better, on the contrary it was worse and I was feeling very demotivated. In the midst of my frustrations, I did seem to find the root of the problem though. The model's texture had gotten very rough and kind of sandpapery. If we rewind a little bit to when I said, 
You see the tree in the background that my camera insisted on focusing on instead of the model? Yeah, you see it rustling in the wind? That's gonna turn out to be a problem down the line. Well, yeah. So what I figured happened is that the wind dispersed the particles more than usual, plus the fact that they might set mid-air, so when it hits the model, it creates a very grainy texture and makes my life very difficult in that moment. I know. What to do? I can't fix this. <laughs> After going through the whole cycle of, I'm quitting, I can never do this again, I came back to the model after a few hours, and I realized, you know, it might actually not be that bad. <laughs> so I decided to start adding details with acrylic paint. I'm starting by adding details to the legs this time, which is something I usually push to the end and then kind of rush through it, but I want them to look good this time as I'll be adding zebra stripes. These are primitive markings that some fjord horses have, and I thought since the brown done color isn't super flashy by itself, that adding something like this would add some more interest. Here you can see the side I have added details to versus the one I haven't. I'll never shut up about how much of a difference adding details with acrylic make. I also paint the hooves in a dark grey color with a little bit of brown mixed in and I add some highlighting streaks using different shades of grey. I spent quite a lot more time on the legs than I usually would, but I'm kind of pleased I did because I think they turned out really well. Next I'll be spending some time on the face, which is even more important to get right. I'm starting with the eyes. First, darkening the eye socket with some black. Then carefully painting in the eye whites. I make the iris by creating several concentric circles, starting with black. Then a smaller circle of light blue. Then one even smaller with brown. And then I add the pupil. The face in general gets a lot of details, lots of shadows and highlights, and also some fur texture here and there. Apparently, fjord horses can have a small white star on their forehead though it is only accepted on mares and geldings, and it shouldn't be bigger than a US quarter, which is interesting. Most of the fjord horses I've seen have their foreheads covered by that big forelock anyways, so I thought since this one is so nicely in view that a star would be fitting. The most iconic feature of the fjord is arguably that short black and white mane, so I go in with an off-white shade first, then a very dark brown, and I do a lot of back and forth to nicely blend them together. And there's something really satisfying about painting this. For the tail, I first paint the entire thing in kind of a warm beige color. Then without letting it dry, I go in with the dark brown. And I do a lot of coats with a lot of blending until I have something I'm happy with. And once the blending is sufficient, I of course gotta add those highlights and lowlights, duh. Painting the tail is really its own process. I don't have to be as precise as with the rest of the model, as I can just paint over whatever mistakes I make, and I really like that, it's a nice process. Another detail I can't forget is the dorsal stripe, which I try to get as straight as possible, but it turned out a little bit crooked. For some finishing details, I'm adding some scars and imperfections. Then I sign my work before the last spray of sealant.
I apply UV resin to the eyes to make them glossy and 3D, and once they're done curing in the sun, I can finally call this Fjord Boy finished. <laughs> What's going on here? Guys, I am so happy with this custom. It's been several weeks since I completed him at this point, yet I still keep taking him off my shelf just to look at him because I'm just so happy with him. He's so cute. <laughs> For his name, I had to give it some thought, but I decided to name him Ludwig in the end. Not Ludwig, okay? He's Norwegian. <laughs> I can with confidence say that I have a Fjord model in my collection that I really like now and you know overall I'm just really happy with this project. It was a lot of fun and I really enjoyed it. Now I'd love to hear what you guys think of Ludwig so please do comment that down below. Also what are your opinions on Fjord horses in general? My experiences with riding Fjord horses have been mediocre. <laughs> It kind of felt like they had one speed per gait and there was no arguing with that. Might have been because they were riding school horses, I'm not sure. Anyways, you've come this far in the video, thank you so much for watching. And if you haven't considered liking or subscribing, then maybe you should. And I will see you in my next video. Bye!